Okay, so today we are, our study is about the fourth horse, the fourth, yeah, fourth seal and the fourth horse. We finished the four horses, right? After this, you get seals only. Um, uh, some versions of the of uh, Bible translation say it's a yellow horse, but really a better translation is a pale horse, right? Now, the meaning of the fourth seal is that it represents the pe period of papal dominion during the dark ages. The scarcity of God's word and reign uh, led to spiritual famine during this time, and then there was pestilence and death. And in ad addition, the apostate church literally killed the martyrs who did not agree with the traditions of men. So that is the uh, uh, introduction to the fourth seal, the pale horse. So let's read uh, Revelation uh, 6, 7, and 8, where you find the description of the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse and the name of him who sat on the death and he, heads followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. Okay. So now, like I said, the first rider of the horse was Jesus and definitely second, third and fourth the riders are not Jesus, right? It is in Jesus. It is Satan who rides the church. The horse is the church. So it's Satan who is leading the church. And um, death means pestilence, right? It's what it probably means. Now let's um, unpack the symbol symbolisms and expressions. We have several symbolisms in the fourth seal. First of all, the color, pale, coloras, right? That is what it's called in the, in the Greek. The color of the horse is really a greenish pale. I think I got the correct color there. As when a young shoot comes out of a tree, it is the paleness of death, right? And then we get death and Hades. Uh, Hades is uh, the Greek word for death. Joel is the Hebrew one. Hades is uh, the Greek. Uh, it both means death, right? When a person dies, the grave follows. Now, uh, be, how, how, why does the grave follow? Because uh, dead people are buried, right? When they die. So that is what it means, death and the grave follows. The fourth part, fourth part of the earth means the, the, the devastating power of the fourth horse and its rider is not universal. It is partial, right? So it is partial. It is not the whole, whole earth was not, it was not a universal um, uh, this uh, effect, it didn't have a universal effect. And famine means scarcity of God's word because in the third horse, they took away the word of God. So there was a scarcity of the word of God. So there was a famine and pestilence. Now in the, in the New Testament Greek, the word is um, than, uh, thanatos, technically meaning death, right? So, however, in 30 of the 50 times, it appears in the Old Testament, in the Greek of the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is deba, uh, translated pestilence, right? So to say the fourth horse kills with death would be redundant. Uh, death by the sword and famine brings pestilence and disease in its strain and ultimately leads to death and the grave, right? Uh, you can't kill any other way but by death, right? You are, so probably what it means is famine follows, right? Then you have wild beasts. Um, wild beasts represent the wicked leaders and nations who are inimical to God's people and behave like wild beasts. We will, we will unpack each of these um, symbolisms. And uh, there are several uh, texts to explain what this means. Uh, the wicked beasts, the the wicked leaders of the nations hostile to God's people, they behave like wild animals. And the Bible defends that view as well as we will find it in the spirit of prophecy. Now, uh, the Old Testament background. Now let's um, notice an Old Testament background first of all to the fourth seal is, and the fourth cause. The old, in Old Testament times, by, uh, you know, if you read, Leviticus 26, 
21 to 26, there is an important message there. We have no time to uh, go through it uh, in, in our study today, but I'm sure you can note it down and read it for yourself. It speaks about four judgments of God upon apostate Israel. Now, in Old Testament times, when Israel broke the covenant or apostatized from the truth and assimilated the pagan customs of the surrounding nations, which is what happened during the third horse, right? God would send these very same four judgments that are mentioned in connection with the fourth horse. That is the sword, famine, pestilence, and five weeks, right? God would send those four um, uh, judgments on uh, Israel. Now, we can find all four judgments in Leviticus 26, right? Which is the foundation. Now, did the church during the third period break God's covenant? They most certainly did, right? Now, this is, a, this is an important principle. Now, because Israel in the Old Testament period were God's literal people living in the literal land of Canaan, these judgments were literal. Okay? Is that clear? God's people in the Old Testament time were literal people living in the literal land of Canaan. And these judgments were literal. However, under the fourth seal, as well as in others, we are dealing with spiritual Israel, right? In spiritual land, which is Christian church. And therefore, we need to interpret these calamities in a symbolic manner. Because after the New Testament, um, literal Israel no longer was in existence, right? I mean, there ceased to be God's uh, church uh, as it were the, after the 70 year prophecy. So then it became spiritual, right? The seed of Abraham, in the seed of Abraham, we became, right? So <clears throat> you have to symbolically uh, um, interpret this, these, these, uh, three these four judgments, right? Um, and uh, we, we are told that the papacy trampled on God's covenant during the 1260 years, which we have studied. Now, this was the papal. A dominion. It's a, it was the period of the fourth horse. And there we are explicitly told that the papacy trampled on God, the God's holy covenant during the 1260 years. And we, I think we have studied that uh, as well. So would we expect the same judgments if the papacy trampled on the covenant? Absolutely, right? So that is why we see these four judgments coming. Now let's go to um, uh, talk about death and heavy. Now, the immediate aftermath mark of death is the place where the dead go, and that is the grave, right? The word Hades in Greek is the equivalent to the Hebrew word shoel, and it should consistently be translated the grave, right? We find the link between Hebrew and Greek words in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 54 and 55. Uh, we will read that a little later. Where Apostle Paul quotes Hosea 13, 14, and, he, and the use of the word Hades, and uses the word Hades in place of Shoel. So the book of uh, Hosea, in the book of Hosea, the word for grave is Shoel, and Paul uses the word Hades that shows that Shoel and Hades are synonymous words in two different languages that the Bible was written in, right? Now, unfortunately, the King James Version 31 times mistakenly translate the, translates the Hebrew word shoel as the word hell, right? It really should be translated grave. Now, the Old Testament regularly links the concepts of death and the grave in synonymous parallelism, right? Most of the time in lots of Old Testament scriptures, you have syn syn um, synonymous parallelism. parallelism in text, right? So you say one thing and then they give you the explanation in the same thing in the next term, the next frame. So in other words, death and grave are, are somewhat synonymous because when a person dies, they obviously have to go to the grave. Now let's start reading uh, some of the Bible verses that are going to come up there. Let's start with Psalm 6 verse 5. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Okay, so did you notice the parallelism? Find death, there is no remembrance of you. Then the next phrase says, in the grave, who will 
give you thanks. So that is the Hebrew parallelism there, right? So we find uh, different words used to explain. So death is explained as graveyard. For the grave, for in the grave, you have no remembrance. And in the grave, nobody is going to praise you because you're dead, right? So the death and so death and the grave are linked because when a person dies, obviously they have to be buried, right? Or cremated. Now notice again, death and the grave to, together again in Psalms 106, uh, Psalms 89, 48. Psalms 89, 48. What mind can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? I hope you're seeing the parallelism. Let's read uh, Psalms 116.3. The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of shore led hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Okay, so here David is saying the, uh, the pains of death surround me and the pangs of shore. So Shoel obviously is grave if you are looking at the synonym, uh, see the synonymous parallelism in it, right? Now uh, let's look at Isaiah 38, 19. For Shoel cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. Okay, so here in Isaiah, so once again, you find that death and the grave are together right they are they are together now let's read uh, isaiah 28 15 uh, because um, now this is just a sampling here so you see it's not it's not just choosing one verse and then making an entire application out of it the fact is death and the grave are linked together not only in revelation chapter 6 but elsewhere in the bible as well so let's read isaiah chapter 28 15 because you have said we have made a convenient with death and with so show we are in agreement. Okay, so is a covenant an agreement? So, uh, so are death and the grave linked together? They are synonymous basically. But yes, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with show we are in agreement, right? So covenant is an agreement and uh, death and show are uh, synonymous, right? Synonyms uh, used in the Bible. Now let's go to Hosea. Here, yes, this is the key text, right? And here God is speaking <coughs> in Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from the death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Okay, now remember that, right? Uh, here Hosea is saying, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And he says, oh, oh death, I will be your plague. Oh grave, I will be your destruction. Now Paul paraphrases this in that famous text that we know uh, in um, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and um, we hear this when we go for practically every funeral. Let's notice how the Apostle Paul actually draws on Hosea, but he doesn't quote Hosea textually, but he draws on the terminology and, and only instead of the word grave, which is Hades, he uses the word Shoel, which is the Hebrew Old Testament uh, word. So let's read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has to immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it's written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where, where is your sting? O heads, where is your victory? Mm. Right, we have heard that many times, right? So Paul is um, quoting from Hosea 13, 14, right? He's, so he's drawing on the book of Hosea. Only in Hosea, the word for grave is hell. Right, the word for grave in the New Testament Greek is Hades. So death and Hades are linked just like death and Shoel are linked together. They are uh, the same word in two different languages. Now the question is, does the word Shoel and does the word Hades means hell, a place of burning? No, now we found out from so many texts, not just one, so many texts in the Old Testament, it simply means the grave, right? 
So when a person dies, the next step is to be buried in the grave. So death and the grave follow this yellow horse. Okay. Now there is another place where we can link the word Shoel with the word Hades. And that is in Acts 2, 25 to 27, and then 30 and 31. Here, Peter on the day of Pentecost is drawing on a passage that we find in Psalm 16, verses 8 to 10. And in the Greek, the word grave, like I said before, is Hades. Whereas in the Old Testament, in Psalm 16, the word that David uses there, the Hebrew word is Shoel. So that is why we know that Shoel and Hades are synonymous in different uh, languages. Let's read this and see. Now, this is, um, sorry, this is um, uh, Peter quoting from Psalms 116, right? For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in heads, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in heads, nor did his flesh see corruption. Okay, now this is Jesus speaking prophetically, right? And when he says, my soul... Um, shall not uh, not be left in Hades. If you actually, the new international version for the state of the dead is much better translations. Um, it, it, uh, if, um, it says you will not leave my me uh, in the grave, right? That is the better translation where Jesus says you will not leave me in the grave uh, and uh, you will uh, not leave my soul. Now you will, will you leave me in, uh, in the grave? And uh, my, my body will see no corruption. That means no um, decomposition, right? That's what this is the prophet, prophetic, messianic prophecy of Jesus. Jesus speaking prophetically in Psalms um, 16, 8 to 10, where Peter uh, is quoting this on the day of Pentecost, right? So uh, basically um, with this pale horse, you have a reference to death and death and Hades, which is the same. It doesn't mean death and hell. It means death and the grave. Now, why am I explaining Hades and Shoel? Because the Bible translations call it hell and hell people, um, uh, hell, the, 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 the connotation that people have is that hell is eternal burning fire, which is not biblical, right? So the Bible clearly tells us that death and Hades and Shoel means the grave because, the, um, because this is the pale horse. And this horse brings death, physical death, as well as spiritual death, as we're going to do, right? Now, first, he brings it by famine. And because of famine for the word of God, there is darkness because the light, the, the word of God is the light. And there is no light that we not noticed in last time seal, the third seal. And second, because those who didn't agree with the church um, during that time were killed physically, right? That is why the the martyrs are crying out in the fifth seal that we are going to study next week. The fifth seal has two, two parts to it, two, two parts to it. We will study that next time, right? So uh, now the key, key question at this point is, what caused the, this church to die and go to the grave? The answer is the four fact, that four factors led to death leading into the grave. Now the first one, let's go to, uh, the sword, right? The key verses uh, we have covered before, we covered this, in, uh, I think, last week. So we will not dwell too much on the key verses to understand the symbolic meaning of the sword in the uh, fourth seal. Um, but uh, you find it in uh, Romans 13, 1 to 2 and, uh, and 4. Well, Romans, Romans 13, 1 to 4, right? and Revelation 13, 10, and then verse 14. 
So we have seen, uh, as we have seen more often than not, uh, when the sword of the spirit convicts of sin, it awakens the sword of persecution on the part of those who wish to suppress that uh, uh, conviction in the heart, right? And we notice that in the third scene, right? We, we notice that in the third scene. Let's read Romans uh, 13 verse 4. Uh, because this is speaking about the civil powers, right? Romans 13 verse 4 is speaking about the civil powers. Let's read that. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Okay. Now for some additional explanation on this. In apocalyptic prophecy, right? Um, symbols are fluid. That is, they take on different meaning depending on the context in which they appear. We are aware of that, right? That is why the sword can represent the word of God as we see it in Hebrews 4 and Ephesians. However, the sword can also represent the punitive power of the state to punish transgressors, transgressors of the civil law. Right? We found that out last time. Now, during the period of the fourth horse, the apostate paper system used the sword of the state to persecute and kill those who disagreed with its doctrines and practices. Right? Now, they didn't have, the papacy didn't have an army, but the papacy means when the church and state are joined together. If, if it's just the, just the Roman Catholic Church, then it is not the papacy. But when the papacy joins with the state to use the state to do her work, that becomes papacy, right? So we find that during this papal system of 1,260 years, the, the church used the state um, to the state system uh, to persecute people. Now, did it... Um, did it use the Bible to kill? No, it, because it can't represent the Bible. The papacy didn't use the Bible to kill, but it used the sword of the civil power, right? Now, how many armies did the papacy have? Did they have tanks? How many missiles did they have? Well, it, they didn't, as, 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 as a, a religious organ body, church, they didn't have any. But it will have all of these because it links up with the state. And if it becomes one with the state, then it has the state army. Yes. Then it has the state uh, uh, arsenal, the missiles, the tanks, the soldiers, the uh, air force, everything, right? And it has all the support of the state, right? The civil state. Uh, but it has none of its own. It doesn't have anything of its own. It uses the states, um, civil powers, right? Now, what did the papacy do, do during the 1260 years? It linked up with the state and it used the sword of the state to punish those who didn't agree with its practices and its beliefs and it killed with the sword, right? We saw persecution in France, <coughs> in Germany, in all the um, European countries. The, the papacy controlled the kings and the princes, and they used their civil powers to kill uh, the martyrs, right? Now, as a result of the martyrs being killed, the martyrs cry out for justice under the fifth seal. But the interesting thing is that the same power that killed with the sword receives a deadly wound by the sword, right? The sword turned against them and gave them a deadly wound. So at the end of the 2,600, um, 2, 1,260 years, in 1798, the sword of the state, which was France, turned on the papacy and gave it a deadly wound because um, Berthier's, um, General Berthier's uh, army took the Pope, cap Pope captive and the papacy lost its power it had on the, um, on the state. Right, and the Pope dies in captivity, but the church goes on. The church, as a church, is not papacy, but the church, church, when it's joined to the state, then it becomes papacy. Now, let's notice Revelation 13, verses 9 and 10, um, which tells us 
uh, talks about this uh, deadly bone that the paper CDC. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Ten, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, so kills with the sword, will be killed with the sword. That is what it's referring to here. Um, uh, when the papacy was uh, taken into captivity. Now, did, did the papacy lead into captivity, yes, right? Was the papacy led into captivity? Yes, so the papacy killed with the sword and the sword gave the papacy its deadly wound, right? So that is why uh, Revelation 39 and uh, 10, 10 tells us that the, the one who leads into captivity will be led into captivity. Captivity. Now, the first thing that this yellow horse does, it's, it takes away peace by, uh, by killing those who do not agree with the church with the sport, uh, with the aid or help of the state, right? Now, in the New King James Version, Revelation 13 verses 9 and 10, uh, uh, and Revelation 6, 8 tells us that the power was given. Now, listen to the tense, right? Power was given. Uh, a better translation for power would be authority, right? Authority was given. Power is authority, right? So the two Greek words that are translated power in the King James and the New King James, the first word is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. Um, from that, uh, it's not, but it's not from that root word that it's here. Here the word is ex exousia, which means authority. So here it says power, authority was given uh, uh, given to death and the grave to kill with the sword. So it's hardly, hardly coincidence that the little horn, if you read Daniel 7.25, it says the little horn was given power to make war against the saints and to overcome it. So the little horn was given authority to overcome the saints. Then in Revelation 13.7, the beast, which is equivalent to the little horse of Daniel 7, once again, it tells us that the beast was given power to make war with the saints. So God, the, the restrainer is removed and God lets the papacy, um, you know, to come out in, 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 in their true colors, as it were, right? And their true color was pale horn, right? Now, how else did the papal system kill people, right? Uh, in, in symbolic terms, Famine comes when the Holy Spirit peeking through the word is scarce. Now, famine comes when it doesn't rain. Where it doesn't rain, there's scarcity of food, right? We are aware of that. Now, during the, the dark ages, there was no rain, right? Now, we are not talking about literal rain. Um, uh, we are talking about spiritual, the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know that during the 1260 years, there was no rain? Because Revelation 11 says that the two witnesses closed the heavens so that it would not rain during their prophecy, during the same period. So there was no rain. So the Bible was not available. That is the two witnesses. The New and the Old Testament was not available to the common man to read. And so then there was a scarcity of the word of God. There was scarcity of bread, which resulted in famine, spiritual hunger. Famine in turn led to malnutrition, spiritual malnutrition, and malnutrition led to pestilence, disease, and ultimately pestilence led to death, right? So, uh, uh, is, is the uh, picture, picture oh, clear you. here? Thank you, thank now, you. Uh, the prophet Isaiah explained the symbolic meaning of rain, bread, and the word. So, let's read Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sour and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes, from, go, goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Okay, 
So Isaiah here is explaining it. He's saying, does, uh, does the falling rain have anything to do with giving bread? Yes, right? Uh, the, the comparison of rain and bread, rain give, it makes crops grow and then the grain is harvested and bread is made. So when, when there is no rain, the result is that it is very expensive, right? We saw that in the last, uh, um, last seal. Uh, and uh, when there is a scarcity of the Holy Spirit, um, now was there a scarcity of the Holy Spirit during the period of the Roman Catholic uh, papacy? Yes, there was a scarcity, but the Holy Spirit was there, right? God did not withdraw his spirit completely because you get the world and sees there. But there was a scarcity of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, there was there was actually there was a scarcity of the word of God as well. So there was no bread, right? People were spiritually dead. Uh, now, like I said, the Walden Seas had to hide in the Piedmont and they wrote little texts of scripture on little pieces of parchment, which they sewed into their garments. And they used to be traveling salesmen, right? And they would give these pieces of parchment with scripture to people who, whom they knew were willing uh, to read the scripture, right? And um, we know that lay, lay, lay people were strictly forbidden. They were killed, right? So the um, Waldensians actually took a risk, but they took these little parchments where they wrote the Bible by hand and they counted the words so that they didn't miss anything, right? So they took it, they went down into the valleys because they were in the Pied Mount Mountains. Um, and they shared the gospel. So there was a trickle of the Holy Spirit, but it was scarce. That's why in the last uh, um, seal, we found that bread was very, very expensive, right? Um, uh, so was there famine, famine once again during these people? Yes, because the Holy Spirit was scarce. Was there spiritual hunger? Yes. And who, whoever did not agree with the church, the church used the state uh, the sword of the state and kill those who didn't agree with them. Now notice Deuteronomy 32 verse 2 which is talking about rain and uh, the spirit, right? Let my teaching let my teaching drop as the rain. You read Go that. ahead, dear. Emma? Ah, okay. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as shovels on the grass. Beautiful, no, that is. <laughs> Let my teachings drop as rain, my speech distill as the dew, and raindrops on tender herbs as the showers of grass. So we see here that teaching once again is related to rain, right? Now let's go to um, Hosea. 6.3, uh, notice that uh, once again, the knowledge of the Lord, a speech of God's word, all have to do with God communicating to us. Let's read Hosea 6.3. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His glory, his going forth is established at the morning. He will come to us like the rain like the latter and former rain to the earth. Okay, so a time is coming when there is going to be a famine on earth, right? Was there a famine during the 1260 years? Yes, but Amos um, 8, 11 to 12, which is our next verse, is talking about a famine during um, the dark ages when the papacy had dominion there was still some of God's word, right? There was still some of God's faithful people that assimilated the word. But there is a time coming, right? Now, that is what Imach is talking about. There is a time coming when probation closes on this earth. You know, you and I are going to be, hopefully be in that, during that time, when nobody is going to be able to find the word of God because there's going to be a famine in the land and they will seek for the word of God and will not be able to find it, right? Now, this is when probation closes. So it's a good idea for us to memorize, right? When you read it often, you will remember the Bible. Let's um, read Amos 8, 11, and 12. 
Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land and a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Mm. So this is a warning that is coming, right? So when it rains, the crops grow, right? The Holy Spirit falls. It, it's connected with the word. And as a result, people are spiritually healthy, right? When it, when, now you, now, right now there's, there is the Holy Spirit is there, the word is there, but if we fail to study it, we can still be malnourished, right? But when, when um, the, there is going to come a time in the not too distant future, when there won't be the word, and then uh, people will try to look for the word and they will not find it, right? That is what Amos is saying here. Now, what about the wild beasts, right? The wild beasts are also symbolic, right? We are dealing with symbols, right? In scripture, wild individuals um, are the ones who are hateful and want to destroy God's people. And they are compared to wild beasts. Now, we are going to read several uh, texts here. So get close to your screen and start reading. Let's start with Psalms 74, 18 to 19. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Mm, now it compares the wild beasts are compared to the enemy. Now notice Psalms 7, 1 and 2. Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. Let they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there's none to deliver. Mm. Those who persecute, right? So once again, enemies are compared to a lion that devours and tears to pieces, right? What principle now? Stop a little bit and think. What principle are we using here to understand what wild beasts are uh, symbolically represented? We are going to the rest of the Bible to identify who wild beasts are, right? Now, in the fourth seal, uh, it doesn't give an explanation to who wild beasts are, right? So, um, it, uh, so what does it do? So, what do we do? We see what wild beasts mean symbolically in other places of the Bible. That is what uh, the hermeneutics of how we are studying. So we, we look for wild beasts in the rest of the Bible and we read it and then we are getting an understanding that wild beasts represent the enemy. Wild beasts are represented to a lion tearing people apart, right? To pieces. So that is how we understand that the wild beasts of the, uh, of fourth, of the fourth seal represent the enemies who kill. Now let's read Psalm 10 verses 9 to 11. He lies in wait secretly, a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he touches his lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see it. Okay. So notice uh, the use of mannerisms of the lion crouching, right? Is that what the religious leaders said during the 1260 years? Was God seeing? He's right. God was seeing, right? He was writing it all in the heavenly books. And he's going to rectify all those wrongs in the judgment, right? Now, it makes me think of um, John Huss. I think we have read about John Huss, especially in the Great Controversy. Um, for those of you who, are, who don't know John Huss, John Huss was a, a martyr in the, during the 1260 years. 
He was tried there in the cathedral in Prague, in Constance actually. He was taken to Constance from Prague. He was tried in the cathedral and he was found guilty. Was he guilty? No, he was found guilty of um, worshiping according to the Bible, right? He was taken and then he was taken and burned at the stake. Was that just? No, totally unjust, right? The earthly judgment was wrong. Now, does the time have to come then that needs, that wrong judgment needs to be rectified. And where is it going to be rectified? When Hassel's name appears in the heavenly judgment, it will be shown that those who did that to him were wrong and Hass was right in other words. The reward will be reversed. Hass will be rewarded with eternal life like it should have happened before. And those who oppressed him will suffer eternal death. So that is what the judgment of Daniel 7 is about, to rectify the wrongs uh, that took place uh, in, um, in, on this earth, right? So it will rectify the wrong. Now, um, notice Psalm 17, verses 9 through 12. They are still talking about the wild beasts, right? They are still identifying them with the wicked leaders. From the wicked who oppress, oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me, they have closed up their fat hearts with their mouths. They speak proudly. They have now sur surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey and like a, li and like a young lion lurking in secret places. Okay, uh, next one, Psalms 22, 12 to 13. Now, this is the Messianic uh, Psalm. It's talking about the suffering of Jesus, uh, Jesus at the hands of his enemy. Let's read that and see. It, is, it also brings out the wild beast uh, concept. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Mm. Are you catching the picture? Let's read um, Proverbs, Proverbs 28, 15. Like, like a roaring lion. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like a roaring lion and a charging bit. There is a wicked ruler over four people. Okay, so roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler, right? Proverbs gives it to us clearly. And then we have Zechariah 10 3. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goatherds. Goat herds, for the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. Okay, so literally the Hebrew word there is he goats, right? It's for goats, it means leaders, right? The new, new international version calls it leaders, translates it as leaders. Now, Paul in the New Testament warned the church in Ephesus with the following words. He also used this very descriptive follow, uh, words in uh, Acts 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage bulls will come in among you, not, not, bring, not, not sparing the flock. Okay, now he is not talking about literal wolves here, right? These are symbolic wolves, and uh, sim uh, it's not a very, it's not very complimentary, right? He's saying there will come uh, symbolic wolves um, uh, within the flock, uh, into the flock when he is God. Then Matthew seven fifteen. Here Jesus is speaking. Yeah. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Okay, so uh, have you got the picture? Wolves symbolically mean evil enemies, right? Who persecute the church of God, right? They are like uh, the, a wild lion, a bear, and wolves, right? So that is what oh. wild beasts represent in the um, in the fourth field. Now let's see what uh, um, uh, spirit of prophecy has to say. Mrs. White, she understood that the wild beast symbolizes those who are enemical, they are a hostile, um, hostile uh, to Christ and his people. Let's read the Divine Herald, August 18, 1896. The symbols of earthly governments are wild beasts, but in the kingdom of Christ, men are called upon to behold not the ferocious beast, but the Lamb of God. Review and so, along the yeah, so she says wild beasts um, are symbols of earthly governments, right? Now, in the next one, into in spirit of, um, yes, in the next one, Mrs. White uh, is speaking here about the hatred of Doeg, the Edomite, who, who was against Saul. Actually, Doeg was against, um, he, he was, he didn't like David, right? And he led, uh, he, he actually, uh, Doeg led to the destruction of an entire city with all its priests, 85 priests, all of the people there, all of the beasts. The city was totally demolished because Doeg hated David. But um, the story is too much. We can read it for ourselves. He didn't hate Saul. He hated David, right? So let's read that uh, from Spirit of Prophecy, September 21, 1888. Like savage beasts who have tasted of blood, so were Saul and Leo. Okay, so, so Saul and uh, the, this, this evil king, um, the Edomite king, they allied themselves to try and get rid of David, right? So, and they are compared to savage beasts. Now, notice the following um, statement. This is a uh, condemnation. Uh, this is uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume Three, Page One, Twenty Two. This is a condemnation of Jesus that uh, of Jesus was pronounced by the judges. This is the condemnation of Jesus that the judges pronounced. When the condemnation of Jesus was pronounced by the judges, a satanic fury took possession of the people. The row of voices was like that of wild beasts. They made a rush toward Jesus, crying, He is guilty, put him to death. And had it not been for the Roman soldiers, Jesus would have would not have lived to be hanged upon the cross of Calvary. He would have been torn in pieces before he started, and not Roman authority interfered and by force of arms withheld the violence of the mob. Imagine the fury of those people. It was satanic fury, right? They were willing to tear Jesus apart. So, so, so furious they were with, uh, with Christ, right? So it, uh, in live sketches of, uh, from the life of Paul, page 19, we have another quotation. This is talking about the stoning of Stephen. Uh, where they, uh, they were more like wild beasts of prey than like human beings. Let's read that and see. At this, the priests and rulers were beside themselves with anger. They were more like wild beasts of prey than like human beings. They rushed upon Stephen, gnashing their teeth. Mm, can you can you feel the intensity of the of the um, wickedness described in? So, are you getting a picture? The wild wild beasts of the fourth sea are the uh, wicked rulers of the governments. Right now, in Minister of Healing, page ninety five, we have another quotation. Let's read that. 
so that we get the full picture of what uh, when you read the fourth seal and you read by this you will know to connect it to the um, to the to the, the to the uh, governments of this country right of, of the world the, the those who are against christ people let's read ministry of healing page 95 from some hiding place among the tombs two madmen rushed upon them as if to tear them in pieces Hanging about these men are parts of chains that they have broken in escaping from confinement. Their flesh is torn and bleeding. Their eyes glare out from their long and matted hair. The very likeness of humanity seems to have been blotted out. They uh, look more like wild beasts than like men. Wow, quite a description, right? And. Mm. Uh, now we are entering the papal period because the fourth horse is the period of papal dominion. And once again, while papacy is, once again, let's see how papacy is compared to wild bees. Go ahead. As the ravenous beast is rendered more furious by the taste of blood, so the rage of the papist was kindled to greater intensity by the sufferings of their victims. But intensity, no? I mean, just, just try to picture it. And the next one is the death of Jerome. Now, Jerome was a um, martyr as well. Let's read that and see how they just uh, martyred Jerome. Their thirst for, for blood, wetted by the death of us, clamored for fresh victims. Only by an unreserved surrender of the troops could Jerome preserve his life, but he had determined to avow his faith and follow his brother martyr to the flames. Okay, so that is talking about the papal period, which we are discussing now, the fourth seal. So the papacy is what is referred to as the wild beast in that, um, in that fourth um, seal. Now, um, I think um, we have read about Paul, where it states that he fought against wild beasts in an amphitheater. Now, Paul never fought with, um, he was thrown to the Colosseum to fight with um, wild beasts. Uh, he, he, this is his figuratively speaking, right? Now, let's notice this perspective remark by Mrs. White, uh, which is found in the sketches from the life of Paul, page 78. Paul in Okay. Paul informed the Corinthians of his trouble in Asia, where he says, we were pressed out of measure about strength, inasmuch that we despaired even of life. In his first episode, he speaks of fighting with beasts at Ephesus. He thus refers to the fanatical mob that clamored for his life. They were indeed more like furious wild beasts than men. Mm. Right, so now you have a clear idea uh, of uh, who the wild beasts are. So did the papacy treat God's people? Um, did they try to get rid of God's people? Were they like wild beasts? The wild beasts represent the leaders of the papal church that persecuted, killed, tried to kill God's people, right? And the papacy killed people with the famine for the word of God. The papacy killed people with the sword and acted like wild beasts, right? Now, this is all true of this period of history. If you go into history books and read, you will find that it is true. The best history book you can get to read about this is a great controversy. If you haven't had time to read it, I encourage you uh, to read the great controversy because Mrs. White gives a Beautiful description of this time period when uh, during the 1260 years, right? So, without a shadow of a doubt, we know that the white beasts of uh, the fourth seal represent the papal leaders of that time. Now, um, during the fourth horse, now the fourth horse is the same period as the fourth church, right? The, the fourth horse. Is the period of papacy. Now, we, when we were doing the churches, remember we did Tadara. Now, the fourth horse represents 
um, the paper, see where death is being brought by wild animals, right? Wild beasts. That is that those are the leaders of the church who are furious mm -hmm. and want to destroy God's people by the <laughs> civil power, right? By the civil sword. And they use the state uh, to accomplish their killings. And then they, they forbid the, the, the word of God to go to the lay members, uh, to lay people. So the people didn't have the, uh, the Bible in their hands. And by this famine, there was no rain. Uh, in, uh, in the reign of the Holy Spirit, there was a scarcity of God's word and people were dying spiritually and many were being killed physically as well, right? They say about 50 million people were killed during this time, right? Now, this is parallel to the Tatara, the fourth church, the church for church. Now, let's draw quickly some parallels uh, between uh, the, the fourth church uh, where it gets very interesting. Now, the Old Testament background to the church of Tyatara is the story of Elijah, remember? And the central protagonist in that is Jezebel, right? During this period of the first church, because Jezebel is mentioned by name. So the church during this period was like Jezebel. So we need to know something about Jezebel. We remember, let's, uh, let's recall some of it, right? So we need to understand how the church behaved. Let's so it, um, during this uh, uh, period of the Yellow Horse, now, because Israel had apostatized from the covenant of the Lord, the four judgments of Leviticus 26 fell on the people in the days of Elijah, right? The Old Testament story of Jezebel, where she employed the civil power of Ahab, who was the king, that was the sword, to extend her apostate synchron district that is amalgamation of many religions she was a uh, she was a heathen um, priest's daughter right so it took she blended the worship of sun god Baal with the worship of uh, jehovah worship with the worship of the lord and was israel only worshiping Baal, or were they, they claiming to worship both they were right remember elijah on mount carbon he says, mm -hmm. how long hold he between two opinions? That if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. So in other words, um, I think they were serving both God and Baal. They were, it was a, a amalgamation, right? It was kind of an ecumenical nonsense that was taking place there, right? At the time. We are told in First Kings um, that Ahab killed the prophets of the Lord with the sword, right? He used his uh, civil power. And it, um, now is that one of the judgments of the four thoughts? Yes, right? Remember the, remember the parallels. Now this apostasy led to a severe drought. Now, remember we are dealing with literal in the Old Testament, right? There was actually no rain for three and a half years. We find that in Second Chronicles and James also tells us. Now, can you find a parallel in during the 1260 years? Yes, right? It sounds very familiar. The drought led to famine and pestilence, right? That is death. And famine and pestilence in turn led to death and the grave because Israel forsook the covenant, right, of God. And the same thing happens in the fourth church under the fourth horse, right? There are parallels. So after a time span of three and a half years, Jezebel slaughters the prophets of the Lord and, uh, is, and we find um, she, she kills them because the prophets of God are not uh, embracing her uh, synchronistic religion, right? She taught God's servants to fornicate, to practice idolatry. Therefore, the blood of God's servants and the prophets cry out for justice. Now, prophetically, the story of Jezebel is fulfilled during the uh, period of the little horn, dominion of the little horn, which is parallel to uh, the pale horse, right? And the beast, uh, and of the beast who massacred the saints, right? Of the most high for three and a half prophetic years. Now in, in Israel, it was three and a half literal years. Remember in, uh, in after the New Testament, we are dealing with prophetic time, right? So it's prophetic time, prophetic three and a half years, which is 1,260 years. Now during this uh, period, the apostate church, we, we see, um, employs the sword of state to kill dissenters, right? 
And as a result, the church fled to the wilderness where God nourished her in exile. Now, did this happen during the 1260 years? Did Elijah flee to the wilderness and God feed him there? How about the church during the 1260 years? Did she flee to the wilderness? And did God feed her there? Can you see the typological uh, prophecy of this, right? All that took place during this, the, the, we find that the people fled to the wilderness, which represented the territory of the United, uh, of America, right? America was the country then. So they found refuge there and God fed them there um, till, uh, during this time. Now, as a result, God nourishes his church in exile, first uh, in the uh, in the Waldens is in the uh, in the in the Paldemar Mountains, and then when they uh, uh, when they flee to the territory of America. Now that now in this period uh, was when the witnesses prophesied in sackcloth, right, which represents darkness. And the one thousand took to, now another thing is dark ages. If you if you really study history, you will find that there was no literature, there was no art, moral, mor the morality of society was at its worst, right? So society was in darkness, the, 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 nothing, even the arts, the uh, literature, the sciences didn't develop in these 1260 years. That is why they're called the dark ages because God's spirit was not there, right? So God shuts up heaven, and there was no rain, and as a result, the, the fine spiritual famine and pestilence, right? Which ultimately lead to death and the grave. Now, same parallel happened with, uh, during the days of Elijah. Now, this horse brings death and the grave for two reasons, right? The first is because there was spiritual starvation and pestilence in the church during the third seal, right? And second is because the people died by the sword, that is the mark, right? Now, during this period, the man of sin suppressed the Bible, forbidding lay people to read it under the pain of death. You know, the Bibles were chained to the pulpits in churches. They were in Latin, a language that the people couldn't understand, right? And uh, reading the Bible was capital punishment, even to have a Bible in one's end, right? And as a result, we find that there is a scarcity of the word of God. A famine leads to spiritual pestilence and death. Now, this was fulfilled exactly during this fourth period of history in the Christian church. Notice what Mrs. White, how Mrs. White describes this period in Great Controversy, page 51. For hundreds, hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it or to have it in their houses and unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Mm, they interpreted it any way they wanted. So there was an absolute famine of the word of God. Now speaking about the Waldensians in Great Controversy, page 76, let's see what she has to say. This is about the Waldensians, right? From earliest childhood, the youth were instructed in the scriptures and taught to regard sacredly the claims of the law of God. Copies of the Bible were rare. Therefore, its precious words were committed to memory. Many were able to repeat large portions of both the Old and the New Testament. Wow. Wow, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful, isn't that, Adi? So, as yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was bread scarce, yes, right? The, notice yeah. there was, it was not an absence of bread. Bread is expensive because it is rare. Remember the, in, the, the, um, in the third horse, it was very expensive. Bread was there, but it was expensive because there was, oh. it was rare, right? Now notice the statement from Spirit of Prophecy, volume four, page 192. The work which the papacy had begun during the 1260 years, atheism completed. The one withheld from the people the truths of the Bible. The other taught them to reject both the Bible and its author. The seed sown by priests and prelates was yielding its evil fruit. Mm. 
So the papers he withheld that uh, withheld the scripture from the people. The French Revolution totally rejected both of them, right? During the French Revolution, they burnt all the Bibles that were there, right? So mm. that led to atheism and total anarchy, right? We when you read the, about the French Revolution, it tells you much about the wickedness of people because there was no word of God. Now, um, during this time, the wild office of the Inquisition was established, which basically was a church using the power of state to punish dissenters from the church. So they slew those who studied and obeyed the word of God, right? And during this time, the papal leaders behaved like wild beasts towards God's um, people. Notice Mrs. White's description of this violence in page 54 and 55 of the Great Conference. In the sixth century of the papers, he had become firmly established. His seat of power, power was fixed in the impartial city. Sorry, imperial, mm -hmm. imperial city. And the Bishop of Rome was declared to be the head of the entire church. Paganism had given place to papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Revelation 13, 2. And now began uh, the 1260 years of paper oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 13, 5 to 7. Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and worship or to wear away the lives in dungeons or suffer death by the rat, the faggot, or the headsman's axe. Persecution opened upon the faithful, uh, upon the faithful with greater fury than ever before, and the worship became a vast battlefield. Mm. The world became a vast battlefield. Now that was the church, what the church was like during the Middle Ages. And it is estimated, like I said, 50 million of God's faithful children were martyred during this period. 50 million in, in that population of that time. That was a huge number. 50 million even today. Is, now we have only 22 million in Sri Lanka, right? So double us and a little bit more. Um, and during that time, the populations were not so great. So 50 million was a significant amount of people who were killed. Right. Now, she describes again uh, this uh, 13th century inquisition. Let's read that from Great Controversy, page 59 and 60. In the 13th century was established that most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the inquisition. The prince of darkness wrought with the leaders of the papal hierarchy. In their secret councils, Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men, while unseen in the midst stood an angel of God, taking the fearful record of their iniquitous decrees and writing history of deeds too horrible to appear to human eyes. Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. The mangled forms of millions of martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. Okay. Now, it's very interesting. There's an angel in the midst taking a record, right? And I don't think the angel missed one single detail, right? It's all written in the books up in heaven. So are people going to have to face it again? Now, these people who were there would have thought that they, they had nothing to beat them, right? They were the ones who were calling the shots, but there was an angel. Mrs. White is shown in prophecy. There was an angel who was writing down every detail, and the angel didn't miss a single thing, I'm sure. Are all those individuals who oppressed God's people going to be resurrected after the millennium? Are they going to see the great panoramic view? Are they going to see what they did and how they did it? 
only now they're going to recognize that they, are, they, are, they were on the wrong side, whereas the martyrs were on the right side, right? And then Mrs. White alludes the cry for the, the, the martyrs cry for, uh, to God for vengeance. That is the fifth seal, right? We will talk about that. Um, so what are the martyrs doing under the fifth seal? Under the fifth seal, the martyrs are crying out for justice, right? They are crying out after the papers who slew God's faithful people, right? For the better part of 1,260 years. Is that the end of the story? Is there going to be another group of martyrs? Is there going to be the same system that will persecute in the future? Yes. yes. So how many, yes, sorry. So how many stages does the fifth seal have? Like we're going to find out the fifth seal has two stages. The fifth seal, like the sixth seal, Sixth seal also has two stages because the martyrs that were killed during the papal dominion are now crying for justice, right? That God has given them a white robe and he's saying, you're fine. You wait till your, your case is okay. You're saved, right? And he tells them, wait, rest a while until the rest of the martyrs are going to be killed like you are complete. So there's going to be another group of martyrs um, when um, this probation closes during the little time of trouble. <coughs> of course, not during the uh, Jacob's time of trouble, but during the little time of trouble, there will be another group of martyrs um, who will be killed right before probation closes, because after probation closes, nobody dies. But be before probation closes, there will be a group of martyrs who will die, right? And so Jesus tells these martyrs to wait a while. That will be, and we know as we will, continue to study Revelation, that this same persecuting power will, you know, the wound will heal. And we know that in uh, Revelation 13, the United States will give them their state power. So they will use the state power of the world um, leaders now to persecute uh, the, 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 the people of God, right? So the same scenes that took place that Similar scenes, similar things, but it won't be the same. Similar things will take place in the new future, right? Now, we are not believing cunningly devised fables as Adventists, right? When we study contextually the sequence, the seven, the Adventist belief system is rock solid, believe me. The trouble is people only pick a symbol here and pick a symbol there, and they don't see all the structure and the sequence, how things take place in chronological order and how events connect with each other, right? That is the uh, historic system that we as Adventists use to study the Bible. Now, right after this period, the martyrs have been sl slain and they're crying out for God's uh, justice. Let's read another statement from Great Controversy, page 78. The persecutions visited for many centuries upon this God-fearing people, the Waldensians, were endured by them with the patience and consistency that honored their Redeemer, notwithstanding the crusades against them and the inhuman butchery to which they were subjected. They continued to send out their missionaries to scatter the precious truth. They were hunted to death, yet their blood watered the seed sown, and it failed not of yielding fruits. Wow. So are you understanding the sequence of the seals? How one event leads to another? So we move from the third to the fourth, right? And um, once again, the darkness and scarcity of bread um, Let's, let's compare three, four, and the fifth seal is for next. Let's compare the th third and fourth. Uh, uh, during the third seal, uh, scarcity of bread intensified. That intensified under the fourth, fourth seal, which led to death and the grave, spiritual death, right? Because there was a famine for the word and literal death because of the inquisition, which killed those who were not in harmony with the church. And um, history tells us about 50 million were killed. Now, concerning this period, Mrs. White wrote in Great Controversy, page 55. Let's give that a read.
the ascension of the Roman Church to power masked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness deepened. Mm. So what color was the third horse? Black, right? Which is darkness. Uh, was, was there darkness under the third horse? Yes, now we're comparing the horses, right? Uh, but darkness under the fourth horse intensified. It gets worse, right? Um, so the ascension of the Roman Catholic Ch Roman Church to power marked the beginning of the uh, Dark Ages, right? Which was 538 AD. And as her power increased, the darkness deepened. So is the period of the fourth horse, even a greater apostasy than under the third horse. It begins in the third horse, but it deepens under the fourth horse, the period of papal dominion. When the church dies spiritually because she does not feed on the word of God, she begins to destroy those who do not share her lack of spirituality. Those who cannot defend their doctrine with, with the scriptures sword will do so with the literal sword, right? Does that do any good? No, because the more they persecute, the more faithful followers God has. Now, once again, the reason why the church grew is very, in, in very difficult times were, were this, uh, was this that the persecution is persecution. Um, uh, you know, the people saw the constancy, the serenity, the peace of those who killed. Some of the martyrs went singing to their, uh, to their grave. How can these people be killed? And they sing like John Hutz. Uh, his flesh was burning, but he was singing praises to God. How could a person do this? There must be something worth living for. The people saw in the death of these people, you know, the death of us, the death of the martyrs. So many will be in heaven because of that, right? They were willing to die for it. So that was something that, you know, the others sought, right? And that is why the word martyr means witness. A martyr is a witness. The death of the martyr was a witness to God, in other words, far greater than what they could have preached, right? Now, how many do you think would be saved because of the story of the martyrs? Now, take, for instance, Stephen. Um, take, for instance, the martyrdom of John the Baptist, right? Um, John ended up in prison, right? He was depressed. And then Mrs. White says he sends out his disciples because he wasn't sure that Jesus was the Messiah. And then he sent his disciples to ask whether Jesus is the Messiah. And the disciples come and then Jesus tells them to watch. So we find Jesus, uh, that day he healed the sick, he opened the eyes of the blind, he healed the lepers, he raised the dead. And at the end of the day, Jesus tells them to go and tell John what they saw, right? So they took back what they saw uh, and um, told John. And then John died in prison because he was beheaded in prison because he knew that Jesus was the Messiah, right? So how many people are going to be saved as a result of the story of John the Baptist or Stephen or John Huss or, you know, Martin, Martin Luther's? Um, is there going to be multitudes of people who are going to be saved because of their witness, their willingness to stand for the Lord even though the heavens fall, no matter what persecution comes, they stood. So there will be millions in heaven who will be saved because of this martyr. Now will God answer the pleas of the martyrs? When will God judge and avenge his people uh, who have been slain? Let's read this final one from uh, final text for today from Revelation 19, 1 to 2. Um, this is in context of the seventh plague. God is going to intervene. And by the way, this is the harlot, right? At the end of the time, same harlot who persecuted God's people during the 1,260 years, right? Uh, so let's read Revelation 19, 1 and 2. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. 
Wow, that's a promise, right? So both group of martyrs will are going to be avenged by God and justice is going to be executed, right? So meanwhile, the martyrs of the 1260 years are resting, right? Uh, the Bible says they rest for a while. You know, everywhere in the Bible, when it mentions death, it calls it a sleep, right? How I think none of us are afraid to sleep. But um, uh, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, David says, because you are with me. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So the time is coming where we are going to have to stand for our faith. And I pray that all of us here today, may we be faithful. And may the Lord keep us faithful to, to his word. So whatever comes, we will not fall. Mm -hmm.